Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name's Susan Stewart. I'm director of the Open University in Scotland. And I'm delighted that the Open University is sponsoring this session here today with Claire Hunter. Unfortunately, the OU banners did not make it to Cove. <laughs> uh, so I, I have brought my little branded notebook and I'll, I'll wave, it, <laughs> wave it about. Uh, but no, absolutely delighted to, to chair this session and to see so many of you here this morning. Um, Claire's latest book, uh, Embroidering Her Truth, is on Mary, Queen of Scots. And as well as an author, Claire has been a community textile archivist, a textile archivist and curator and established the community enterprise Needleworks in Glasgow in 1990, uh, leading the Year of Culture Keeping Glasgow in Stitches project. In 2009, uh, Claire was commissioned to make a large wall hanging celebrating 500 years of the trade house, uh, I, I think. Uh, and she and the other women who made the hanging uh, became Burgesses and Guild Sisters of Glasgow. And I, I think that means you can keep a sheep on Glasgow Green. And hang your washing And out. hang your washing <laughs> out. So uh, a, a great privilege. Uh, Claire's first book, Threads of Life, won the Saltire First Book Award and was also a Radio 4 Book of the Week. And her new book, uh, Embroidering Her Truth, Mary Queen of Scots in the Language of Power, has uh, garnered many plaudits and is again nominated for a Saltire Award. So congratulations, Claire. So th this is a, an unusual and, and startlingly original uh, kind of book. Uh, you're approaching Mary's life through textiles, but it's also part memoir as well as history and politics. Could you tell us a little bit about why you took that approach and maybe read? I will do. Uh, well, uh, there were two reasons why I mixed um, the kind of research history with uh, stories from my own life. Um, partly it was because, uh, as we all know, in um, Mary's life there's very little to laugh about. <laughs> and um, so I thought, well, it might be actually such a, a, a hard read for people to constantly just read about tragedy. So in order to lighten the tone from time to time and to change the rhythm in terms of writing itself, then I thought I would allow uh, those who are reading it a little breather from time to time with <laughs> snippets from my own life just to lighten the mood. Um, and also, I suppose, I wanted to sh try and see w w what it was that was the sense of connection I had to Mary mm. through her textiles and where we shared where that was a kind of early induction into the beauty of priest vestments at Catholic Mass or where we used it for um, it, it, you know, dressing dolls or etc. So I wanted to find those moments of connection and so that's another reason yeah. why I used it. So I'll read a little bit just, yeah. to, just to show how that worked. Um, Right, thank okay. you. There is only one outfit that I have ever worn that had the impact of Renaissance glory. It was bought as a panacea for a lost love. In the months of my first true romance, I had spent the prerequisite hours locking eyes with my beloved over cooling cups of coffee, writing nesty reams of bad poetry, and suffering, as is usual for first loves, the pain of its end. Shortly after our breakup, I was invited to an event that I knew he would be attending. Pride dictated there had to be triumph. The hurt of rejection overcome, an ex-love regretful of his decision, and, if possible, a garnering of attention from potential new loves eager to fill his shoes. It called for spectacular glamour, the gloss of a new me. As luck would have it, I had just received an installment of my student grant and I took it, all of it, to Fraser's in Glasgow, then the most exclusive department store in the city. I scoured its rails, searching out the perfect redress to abandonment. What I found was a body-hugging midi dress made in the softest of velvets. It was patterned in swirls of the deepest pinks and ruby reds against a background of deep forest green and was graced with a hood lined in glowing crimson satin which framed my face and fell gracefully to my shoulders. Its pièce de résistance, however, was a row of tiny velvet-covered buttons that fastened at the front. They were caught in braided loops, arranged to leave just a slither of flesh visible from neck to navel. 
To complete the outfit, I added teetering high heels and red crocodile leather and sheer burgundy stockings. I went to the event and made my entrance. The dress achieved all I could have hoped for it. It gathered around me a cluster of admirers, leaving my first love, my lost love, standing marooned on the edge, witness to my sartorial triumph. <laughs> <laughs> First week of term, I, I hope you managed to survive for the rest of term, Claire. Just Not only did I survive... Smoking the dress. <laughs> Absolutely, but the dress has survived, <laughs> and it's to this day, 50 years on... And you can and still now, get it now, on. ..now refashioned as a small jacket <laughs> to suit my widening girth. That's seriously impressive. <laughs> so, Mary, of course, is, is one of the most written-about figures in, in Scottish history. What, what drew you to her, and what did you hope to achieve with this book? Well, I think Mary Queen of Scots was somebody that uh, was one of the few females that we knew about as girls mm -hmm. at school. You know, it, you know, she was one of those, those um, one of the, the, the few um, females that, that whose story we knew about, tragic though yeah. it was. Um, but when I was writing my first book, Threads of Life, which was about the social and political significance of sewing, then Mary was a central figure in my third chapter, which was called Power. And when I started to do the research for that chapter, I then unearthed what I didn't know existed, which were all the treasurer's accounts of the time during Mary's reign, which is like her Amazon purchase list yeah. of the yeah. fabric she bought, the thread she bought, the clothes she bought, the gifts she gave. So there was that, all that material, and also the inventories of what she brought back from France in terms of textiles, mm. what she inherited from James V, her father, and Mary de Guise, her mother, in the Royal Wardrobe Store, and then indeed what she accumulated during her times in terms of her inventories that were made both during her reign and later on. And some of those have been annotated by her valet de chambre, Servant de, de Comte, and he would then write whether there were any dispersals from the Royal Wardrobe about maybe clothes of her own that she gifted to her ladies in waiting and other things. And I just thought this was such a rich seam yeah. of material. And what I wanted to do was to see if I could correlate what Mary was actually purchasing or wearing with what was happening in yeah. her life to see whether she was using per textiles, both in a personal way, but also in a political way. And I then went to Stirling University and did an MA in historical research yeah. because I didn't want to be laughed out of court from proper, by proper historians. So I thought I'd better you know, f um, learn the rigor of, you know, uh, of, of, of what I began to call the, the hell of end notes. You this know. is meticulously researched. Mm -hmm. uh, how many years did you take to research before you started It writing? was probably four years yeah. all, you know, from when I had started research for Threads of Life and then did the ME yeah. and then another year of research before the actual book. One of the things I found fascinating is that, that you translate uh, the money into contemporary uh, money terms, so we know exactly what she spent. And I think, like your um, your velvet dress, which you blew your grand check on, her coronation dress was eleven thousand pound. That's was right. One, the uh, she back to I mean, it's always very uh, ambiguous to, to make those um, to match up, I, you know, because of, of devaluation, everything that was going on yeah. at the time. But I, I, and so I did. Originally, I had more of that kind of monetary yeah. exchange, but I, I I just saved it for a couple of yeah. pertinent moments in the book. I, I wonder if they do. It now, I wonder if King Charles's uh, wardrobe is uh, accounted for by by someone. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Well, I don't yes. know that, those kilts. So, <laughs> I mean, the, it's a book about power, uh, and in particular, women's agency, uh, upper class women's mm. agency, uh, and how women of Mary's class utilised embroidery as personal testimony, but also political signal. Can you tell us a little bit more about how? Uh, Renaissance Europe women used textiles and embroidery? Yeah, well, we have to think of textiles and Renaissance as really capturing the spirit of the age, you know, in, in particularly in courts, obviously, every surface was covered in textiles, yep. you know, so you were talking about places that were absolutely festooned in them. And what you displayed, what you gifted, um, what you inherited and how you used that made a statement. Yeah. So textiles weren't decorative, they were declarative yeah. in actual fact, because they, they, they conveyed 
both through their symbolism of colour and image, um, things to do with erudition, to do with lineage, uh, to do with aspiration. Um, and so w w the choices that people made yeah. in terms of what they showed, what they wore, um, and as I say, what they gifted to others was very pertinent in terms of showing where their allegiances lay yeah. and what kind of support they were trying to garner or what their ambitions were. Um, so you would have tapestries, um, you know, when um, Ed Henry VIII was trying to divorce Catherine of Aragon, then he, he commissioned a whole new set of tapestries for his walls, which in biblical terms was a kind of um, allusion to somebody who had um, basically married out of, you know, in, 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 immorally. Yep. and had had to bear the brunt of that without heirs. And so he chose to display a set of tapestries that, that basically um, uh, bolstered his claim that his marriage to Catherine of Aragon was um, yep. immoral yep. Um, because he'd married his father's brother, his, his, brother, his brother's wife, rather. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Mary ha had left Scotland at, at the age of six and, and was raised in, in France and returned uh, to Scotland Queen, uh, a young widow, aged 18. only 18, uh, a Catholic Queen uh, of Scotland in the early days of the Reformation, mm. um, a nation which was enthralled to, to John Knox and uh, a particularly judgmental Calvinism. Uh, and you talk on, on page 71 of how Calvinism gave greater license to moral censure, defamatory rumour and community judgment. And I was quite interested in that Calvinism and, and community judgments and, and potentially parallels with now. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, the Reformation, it, you know, obviously I'll, I'll talk in textile terms, the Reformation in Scotland, because it was Calvinistic, was very different to what had happened yeah. in England. So in England, while they did do the cleansing of the, the, the um, cathedrals and, and monasteries, um, and churches, then what they were doing was clearing away what was the trumpery of Catholicism, and but what they also were doing was appropriating it for themselves. Yeah. So it either went into secular hands, into private houses, or indeed with Henry VIII and, and, and then Elizabeth I, it went into their own chapels. Mm -hmm. So they weren't actually against what it, what it looked like, mm -hmm. uh, what they were against was the richness yeah. that the church had in monetary terms. Mm -hmm. um, what happened in Scotland, however, was different because what Calvinism was against was the idolatry, the worshipping of, um, of objects yeah. as, as having some kind of spiritual value that you could actually pray to a statue and, and through statues yeah. uh, reach God. Uh, whereas they were absolutely, the, the, it was the word of God that yeah. mattered, not anything, in, the, in, nothing else could act as a go-between yeah. you and your God. Yeah. And so they then erased all the Catholic expressions, material expressions of faith. Yeah. Uh, and so Scotland was left with nothing in terms of, of and, and they destroyed it. I mean, it wasn't just that they erased it, they destroyed it, whereas in England, a lot of what was there in terms of Catholic material culture still remained, although in different hands, yeah. out of the church. But in Scotland, it was erased. And not only that, then because of the, the, the aesthetic of Calvinism, which was much more austere, um, then there was a, a real, real um, um, kind of um, distrust of colour, Mm -hmm. of decoration, of fine fabrics. And so you find by near the end of the 16th century, the, the, the assembly of the Church of Scotland basically forbidding any use of embroidery, any use of satin, of taffeta, the colors of red, blue, yellow, etc., are banned. Yeah. Uh, and, and so we then enter a phase when Scotland becomes a very monochrome yeah. and undecorated culture, which of course also robbed us of our kind of cultural heritage, of our kind of crass vernacular mm -hmm. that had come from those pre-Reformation days, yeah. uh, because we did not have around us the material heritage mm -hmm. that had come over has, the Has any of it century. been rediscovered over um, the centuries? Or very has little it? of it. I mean, there are the, you know, some painted ceilings, yeah. there are some vestments, whether they were made in Scotland or whether they were imported later yeah. um, in a covert way. 
um, uh, post-Reformation is, is uncertain. So there's very little. There are remnants. We've got some of Mary's jewellery, for mm -hmm. instance. We've got, we've got, uh, but compared to what you would then find elsewhere, yeah. then very, very little. So in her own dress and her ornamentation at Holyrood uh, and elsewhere, Mary was really kind of putting a veritable two fingers up to Knox and Reformation, or, or to what extent was she trying to accommodate that austerity and, and dress down? Well, the, well, there's two things. One, one is that when Mary came back from France, she brought with her a trove of textiles, um, both in terms of fantastic gowns and, yeah. and, and uh, dresses, etc., um, but also in terms of furnishings, lots of beautifully embroidered bed hangings, which were in those days where the state bedroom was a place of politics mm -hmm. as well as of personal entertainment, yeah. um, then bed hangings were a statement of power, basically. Yeah. So she brought back very lavishly embroidered, uh, with, which have uh, her coats of arms, or etc., on them. But interestingly, she only brought back one set of church furnishings. Mm -hmm. um, so just one set in red velvet, which again stayed in the wardrobe storerooms until uh, 1565 when she married Darnley and then came out again for Princess James's baptism. Yeah. So that would suggest to me that Mary was already being circumspect yeah. in what she then brought from France because she had access, you know, two of her aunts were abbesses, um, one of her uncles was a cardinal in terms of the De Guise yeah. family. So she had access to what would have been the most splendid church furnishings of the time. Yeah. But she chose not to bring those back to Scotland. And I think that for, was her making her own um, statement that actually she wasn't going to try and, and re-establish the, the, yeah. the, the, the material culture of Catholicism in the country. But also then she did use textiles in, the, in her own way. So when she had her first parliament in 1563, uh, then she dressed herself and her ladies in the most sumptuous of, of, of purple velvet with very long trains. And you can just imagine Mary going down the high street in Edinburgh, you know, uh, going towards parliament. Um, with this posse of young women, they were 17 and 18 year olds, yeah, the, four the four Marys and more, sparkling in their jewels, wearing these. Mary was five foot ten inches tall. She was already statuesque. Yeah. And so in Edinburgh, to suddenly have this, this just, um, incredible spectacle mm. of these young women was an absolute um, statement about female power. Yeah, and, and, and like now, uh, did the dress of the court, did Mary Queen of Scots dress influence popular fashion amongst other upper class women? It did in terms of, of what's called the, 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 the Mary headdress, yeah. the particular headdress that she wears that became known as the Mary cap. And in 19th century um, Britain, where amongst the elite um, tableaus and, and, um, and costume balls were very popular, yeah. uh, then lots of Mary caps were seen to be, you know, on display at those. Um, but the other interesting thing about Mary is the actual fact, through the treasurer's accounts, again, until she met, meets Darnley, then the only things that she purchases through the treasury are black garments or black fabric. Because she was in mourning. She was in mourning, but yeah. not for all those years. She yeah. turned to Scotland in 61. Usually mourning would last a year, and then yeah. we'd move into what was called half jewel, where you might wear grey at this point, etc. Right. But black at that time, in the, in the 16th century, was seen as a colour of constancy and of statesmanship. Yeah. And so, it, but when she met Darnley, then for the first time, Mary starts to purchase coloured fabrics through the treasury. Yeah. And although she did have in her own wardrobe garments of, of, of various colours, then she obviously didn't, she didn't use the treasury's accounts to purchase those and must have used her own re um, revenue as Queen Dowager of France. Yeah. So it suggests again to me that she saw Darnley as political business yeah. because she was using state funds to purchase her wardrobe for his entertainment when so he first came it, to Scotland. It, it wasn't a marriage of love, it was a marriage of power. It, wasn't, it, might, it might have become a marriage of, of, of her becoming besotted 
uh, at a later stage, but at the, at the early days, it was very much a, a political oh. negotiation. Oh, interesting. It was also unusually an age of, of women rulers, and, and you say that this female culture was collaborative and supportive and was expressed through alternative mechanisms such as textiles, sewing, gifts and dolls, mediums whose emotional potency went unrecognised by their male peers. Can you tell us a little about Mary's dolls and perhaps read another passage? From I will the book? do. Yeah. I will do. I mean, in terms of, I mean, what was interesting about when I was writing the book was obviously I started off thinking I was writing about Mary Queen of Scots, but actually the book emerges much more about women's agency Aye. in that century because I then, because I was researching other women of the time, then I discovered this common ground of elite women embroidering, sharing gifts with each other and other people of things that they had sewn themselves to give it more potency as a gift of self. Um, and um, things like, you know, Mary, Mary herself, um, taking, when she first comes back to Scotland, taking out of the wardrobe, lots of the clothes that had belonged to her mother, particularly her cloaks, and cloaks, again, at that time, were a symbol of protection. Yeah. So she was then en enveloping herself in her mother's protection by removing those cloaks from the wardrobe. And dolls was a fantastic kind of um, insight into the time, because in all the, the, the histories written about Mary and the biographies, etc. of course, mostly they don't d dwell on women's culture. No. And there's very little in the primary sources that relate to women's culture because the men, and it was all men, who were writing the histories at that time or writing the Mary's narrative were not interested in female culture. So I'll just read you a little bit about the dolls. In a 1578 inventory of Mary's possessions, among her books, clothing, jewellery and accessories, was a basket of what were described as pippinas. More when an earth in a coffer which contained certain replicas of women called Pippinus, being 14 in number, large and small. There are 15 farthingales for them, 19 outer gowns, kirtles and skirt fronts, a bundle of shirts, sleeves, stockings and slippers, a bundle of furnishings for a doll's bed, and another bundle of little conceits and trifles made from bits of gauze and other fabric and two dozen and a half masks. It was a Scottish research and history consultant, Michael Pearce, who made the lateral leap. He connected these entries with two others in an earlier wardrobe account compiled during Mary's reign. In September 1563, Servé de Comte, Mary's valet de chambre, recorded that he had issued Jacques de Soulis, the tailor, with two small pieces of grey damask decorated with gold to make a gown for Poupin and three quarters and a half ells of cloth of silver and white silk to make a petticoat and other things for the poupines. Historians who have made any mention of these pippinis or poupines have hitherto translated the word as puppets. Although in the courts of 16th century Europe, Italian marionettes were beginning to make an appearance, most puppeteers of the day used glove puppets designed as stock characters with their costumes and facial features an intrinsic part of their persona and performance. The pippinets or pippins that Mary had in her care were not only dressed in different outfits, but had also been provided with new garments by her court tailor. They were, in fact, dolls. These inventory dolls might have been kept by Mary to gaze as mementos of her daughter's childhood or bought back from, by Mary from France as nostalgic reminders of her girlhood there. But 14 or more dolls seems to suggest something more than a sentimental attachment. Their interchangeable wardrobe indicates that these dolls were dressed and redressed. Moreover, their clothes were not fashioned from the redundant scraps in a tailor's rag bag, but from cloth inventoried because of its value. They must have had some purpose at court. It is likely that dolls function was to facilitate Mary and her women in the rehearsal of female participation in court festi festivities and ceremonials. Substantive evidence is frustratingly elusive. This possibility, however, is reinforced by the presence of the 30 masks packed away with the dolls' clothes and accessories. If 30 masks were for the dolls, it suggests that they not only had changes of clothes, but of costumes that they were used as miniature replicas of Mary and her entourage. 
Using dolls, the women could rehearse their roles in court revelries. Their entrances and exits, their spacings and groupings could be choreographed. In a culture where the arrangement of colours and textures was an integral part of the visual message, dolls allowed Mary and her women to experiment with the visual impact of their public performances. These dolls offer an insight into how women contributed to the cultural court, cultural life of court. It is a subject scarcely documented. Contemporary chroniclers had scant interest in women's culture distinct from men's. Even modern historians of 16th century Scotland are more interested in the complexity of political ambition and dynastic survival and the dramatic turning points in Mary's life rather than the details of female social and cultural interaction. There are thankfully some notable exceptions, but such insights are thin on the ground. The existence of Mary's dolls, their clothes and accessories suggest that Mary and her retinues use alternative female tropes to those adopted by men to counteract the dominant male-centric culture of the Scottish court. Playing with dolls, while seeming innocuous, just a pastime for girlish pleasure, was possibly a way for these women to share creative ideas, direct their public appearances and ensure that the parts they played in the political diplomacy of court diversions and ritual ceremonies were both effective and impactful. Absolutely fascinating. I mean, to, to what extent do you think that the, the dominant historical narrative uh, relating to Mary, Queen of Scots, is skewed by the fact that male historians have, have largely ignored uh, those softer aspects of cultural power? Well, what's interesting, I suppose, to me is that given that textiles were such an important part of culture of the time, that that has been overlooked. Mm -hmm. and, and my hope was in, in writing the book, <coughs> not just to use it as a prism to explore women's culture, yeah. but also to place it quite rightly at the centre of what was court power. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully I've managed to do that. Yeah, I think, yeah. You know. the, the relationship between Mary and Elizabeth is, of course, central, and, and they also exchanged gifts prior to, to Mary's imprisonment. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of things Elizabeth sent Mary? Well, they exchanged gifts in terms of they exchanged each other's portraits, yeah. and they also exchanged rings. Um, uh, Elizabeth herself was an uh, embroiderer, although we have no record that she ever, ever sent Mary any of her embroidery. Um, but as a young girl, uh, when uh, she, her place in the succession was fragile, um, she then made um, embroidered book covers for Henry VIII, her father, and his then wife Catherine Parr. And they were redolent with um, symbolic in imagery. So she had pansies for thought. Yep. She had interlacing to show the bonds that tied them together. She had allusions to her Tudor lineage. Um, but in the technique she used to sew those, she used very, very difficult techniques right. deliberately in order to prove her skill, her industry, and her um, and, and how appropriate it was that she was uh, a royal princess yeah. and, and, should, uh, and should be part of that Tudor dynasty. Mm. Um, so, so that was interesting. But when Mary moved into captivity, then Mary herself then made Elizabeth embroidered gifts. Mm. Uh, so she made her some little embroidered nightcaps. But then, very interestingly, when she was very much under a cloud, various plots having been made um, in which Mary was implicated um, against Elizabeth and, and to, do, to, to uh, unthrone her, then uh, she then wrote to the um, ambassador in France um, pleading for some very fine red silk and some silver thread for, to be procured for Mary because it was something that needed to be made in a hurry. And what Mary made for Elizabeth was then a skirt, which would have been an unskirt, which was embroidered of red silk, which was embroidered with intertwined thistles and roses. Yeah. Um, and basically red being the colour of blood, the colour of blood bonds, mm -hmm. and the imagery itself being about the, 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 the two women's um, linked dynastic lineage, because of course Mary herself was linked yeah. to the Tudor dynasty through, through Margaret Tudor then um, uh, basically using it as a, as a kind of um, 
a, a way that she hoped would um, lessen Elizabeth's outrage against Elizabeth for her plotting. And indeed, the ambassador was able to report back that it did seem that the Queen's attitude to Mary did soften towards her. Uh, and it was a, a gift woman to woman because yeah. Elizabeth would appreciate, given her own sewing, how much labour had been involved in Mary making this with her own hands. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, sewing as gifts by elite women, something made by yourself for mm -hmm. somebody else with your own hands was a very important emotional and political gesture. Mm -hmm. one, one of the other fascinating characters in the book uh, is a chapter uh, concerned with Bess of Hardwick, and that was who Mary stayed with in the early years of her captivity. Um, she was quite a, an interesting uh, person in her own right. Um, but while uh, Mary was, was a prisoner, she used embroidery to send quite direct political messages to her supporters. Can you tell us more about uh, Bess and Mary's particular collaborations and, and perhaps Read a little bit. Again. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, when when Bess moved in, when Mary moved into the um, guardianship of the Earl of Shrewsbury, his wife, uh, now known as Bess of Hardwick, it was the Countess of Shrewsbury, and Bess was a very able and adept embroiderer, and she had already embarked on an extraordinary project to make very a vast array of large wall hangs that depicted women through the centuries and women in the mythology. Uh, as a celebration of their um, capacity and their achievements. And indeed, those, um, those hangings are still there in Hardwick Hall in Derbyshire, and I'd say to anybody, please go and see them, they are amazing. And they were made out of recycled fabrics from the vestments that had been taken through the English Reformation. Yeah. And May arrived when this was in, pro in, pro in progress, and might indeed, with Bess, have had a little hand, although they are made by professional embroiderers, then those two women might have, have made some of it. But they then, when, when Mary arrived um, in, under the Shrewsbury's care, um, then Bess, at that point, didn't know whether Mary might be restored to the throne of Scotland, or indeed might indeed uh, succeed Elizabeth to the throne of England. So she had to play a clever game of becoming Mary's closest companion. And Mary, surrounded as she was by that time with no other elite woman, although yeah. Bess didn't come from nobility, then she was a, a she was the second richest woman in Britain at that point after Elizabeth She married the well, did she not? She married, several times. She married very well. <laughs> um, but she was also an entrepreneur. She had you yeah. know her her own um, entrepreneurial skills. Let's say. Um, so they then began. To, they embarked on a on a collaborative project to make what would become a bed, set of bed hangings and, and valances um, that had small embroideries within them. So they made worked on what was called slipsy small embroideries, which then would be appliqued onto larger lengths of, of fabric to make the bed hangings, etc. And it is perfectly obvious that within these 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 um, embroideries they did that they had a lot of mischief. Um, and I'll read you a little bit just to just to, to talk about one of those. Um, so I've gone to the Palace of Holyrood House, which has two of the embroideries that Mary did with um, when she was under the Shrewsbury's care, and, uh, and and I'm going to just say a little bit about the cat embroidery. Uh, so I'm just the, the Deborah Clark uh, and Emma Thompson, the creators, uh, past and present creators of Holyrood House, have, have agreed that they would take out of the glass case two of Mary's embroideries and let me see them close up. I can't actually touch them, but I can get my nose it's very close It's quite astonishing them. that they took them out of the case Absolutely. for you. And um, so here I am looking at them. My attention is not focused on the historical poignancy of her embroidery, but on its stitching, on Mary's tactile signature. I wanted to reveal more, reveal more than her skill with needle and thread. I wanted to expose her temperament. In all my research on Mary, Queen of Scots, this is the closest I have ever come to being in her presence. Lying in front of me is a rare remnant of the Scottish Queen, designed by her, wrought by her, purposed to serve as her voice. She had made it for others to see, and she hoped we would understand her better through its viewing but she could have had no idea that it would persist for nearly five centuries to speak to us, to me, now. The embroidery cruciform is larger than I imagined, 
Although I have seen its companion pieces at Oxborough Hall in Norfolk, which is where the, uh, the, the brides of, of Bess and May still survive, they were so tightly clustered with others that it was hard to distinguish their individual appeal. Now isolated, this embroidery seems magnified. It's called a cat. Originating in one of Gesner's black and white woodcuts, Mary has coloured her cat with red-brown thread to better personify it as the red-haired Elizabeth. She has inserted a little mouse scurrying by the cat's paws as its quarry, a personification of Mary herself. This embroidery was undoubtedly inspired by one of Gabrielle Fernel's 16th century fables, whose moral is that those who excuse their actions as just still risk violence from those who believe their own are righteous. Although Mary's cat was copied from Gesner's woodcut, she has altered it to suit her political purpose. Her cat's tail is longer, its ears more rakish, its whiskers more aggressive, and tellingly now, the cat's paw traps the end of the mouse's tail. Seeing it in the flesh is revelatory. Glass acts as a shield, deliberately distancing the viewer. The gleam of glass reduces shadow and diminishes contours. Such separation and alteration limits the opportunity for emotional connection. Now, the time just inches away from Mary's embroidery and able to see it unscreened, the mood of Mary's hand is more obvious. It is unsettled work. Mary's stitches run along rhythmically for a while, then miss a beat and grumble on unevenly before starting to flow again. Mary's cat, plumper, less sleek than Gesner, is executed in meticulous shading. It would have been slow work for Mary to continuously change the colour of her thread to thread yet another needle. But she was determined to make and animate Gesner's original. Such attention evinces more than a crafter's attention to detail. It conjures an act of yearning. It is as if Mary's stitching into her cloth, her pangs of an unreciprocated attachment, as if she is willing each stitch to incrementally draw in Elizabeth. Little Mouse is equally telling. It lacks definition and is depicted as lumpen, squat and stolid. It is poorly drawn, suggesting that it was sketched by Mary herself. If this is the case, it is a sad indictment of Mary's lack of self-worth. It is a lament on and a recognition of her increasing physical and emotional immobility. There are thousands of stitches in a cat alone, 10,000 at least. An embroidery made more complicated by its background of a diamond trellis carpet whose pattern is embellished with blue and edged in gold, an unnecessary if decorative addition. It is as if Mary wanted to linger in its sewing, stitching on and on with her stabbing needle using it symbolically like an arrow to pierce its target. It is as if, through her embroidery, she could connect with Elizabeth and pull her close. Am I right in thinking, Claire, that it was really during of Mary's imprisonment that she took up embroidery to the extent uh, that Yes, that I mean, there was it. one small mention in 1561 right. when she first came to Scotland, um, uh, in one of the court reports of her sitting sewing during Privy Council meetings. Uh, and then when she, get, when she gets imprisoned in Loch Leven, we have um, in the in inventories a dispersal from the Royal Wardrobe um, by Sarah de Comte again of a set of small canvases and embroidery threads for her to, 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 um, to embroider while she was there. And also she herself pleads for an embroiderer to help her draw forth works, yeah. i.e. draw out designs that she yeah. could then embroider, although there's no record of any embroider ever being sent. Yeah. But when she moves into captivity in England and meets with Bess, then she starts to embroider with alacrity. Yes. And not all of which, the, the, the um, reference there to the embroidery of cat, uh, which is about her and Elizabeth, as well as that, she also embroidered a more overt political pieces. So one, um, she, when she was um, planning to marry the Duke of Norfolk, then the most, one of the most powerful men in England, and basically overthrow Elizabeth and return jointly, then marry him and, um, and return, it, England to Catholicism, she then sent Norfolk a cushion 
and um, which she had embroidered herself. And the cushion shows a frilled cuffed hand descending from the righteous clouds of heaven. Uh, and the hand is holding a pruning knife with which it is pruning away unfertile vines, <laughs> i.e. the barren virgin Elizabeth, to allow the younger, more fecund vines to flourish, i.e. the already proven fertile Mary. And in the background of that embroidery is a little um, windmill, which stood for the kind of vacillating religion of England, which had moved from Protestantism with, to Catholicism with Mary Tudor and back to Protestantism again with, with Elizabeth. And a little sturdy church with a triumphant flag, which is the, ca the, the, the Catholic the church, church. And, and also a, a stag, which is a Catholic symbol for triumph over non-believers, etc. And, and the border itself is, is crammed with um, a symbolic imagery for fertility. Mary signed it with her own cipher to make sure its authorship was no doubt. Now, the plot to marry Norfolk was discovered. He was imprisoned in the tower. At his trial, the cushion was cited as evidence of Mary's treason in that plot. And while Norfolk was executed, then Mary herself was, was remained free. The reason being that actually some symbols are very ambiguous. Mm. And while many would understand the treachery that was in that embroidery, it could not be proven. Right. Yeah. Because it might just be a simple pi picture. It was nothing of somebody, subtle about the infertile line. But there's nothing, well, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it couldn't be proven. Absolutely. And um, at her execution, does that, does that cushion still exist, by the way, that embroidered cushion? Now, interestingly enough, the, the cushion was set in trial. <laughs> and in the, um, in the hangings in, in Oxburgh, which is where a cat, is, which, which a cat would have been part of originally, although now it's at the Palace of Holyrood House, um, in later years, although that, those small embroideries that Bess and Mary made together were never assembled during their own lifetimes, they were assembled later. And that cushion cover is there's a central piece in one of those hangings. Mm -hmm. Now, it is not known whether that was the original one yeah. or whether Mary, in defiance, made a replica yeah. in order that that would still exist as part of her story because they, what she did with her embroideries was basically when her letters were censored, etc., then she made, made them her autobiography. Yeah. Um, so they are full of resonance about both her own history, her personal history, her political rivalries, her relationship with Elizabeth, and, and, and sadly, her own um, uh, humiliation. And, she has, and, and there's a set of bed hangings she made for her son, Prince James, who then became James VI and I, um, uh, which sadly no longer survived, yeah. but the description of them does. And, and they're full of, of images like a fallen tree, a broken ship's mast, a canned crisp apple. Very sad. So basically very sad, very sad. to tell James, who was brought up by yeah. the pedant, uh, Latin pedant, George Buchanan, to believe his mother was a murderer and adulteress, yeah. was basically, which is why I call it embroidering her truth, yes. to let, let, at least let him know her truth. Yeah. She was defiant to the end. She and was. at her execution, uh, was wearing a red petticoat under her black gown. She Tell was. us about the significance of the red petticoat. Well, I think you have to imagine the scene. I think you have to imagine the scene of Mary <laughs> arriving for her execution into a room which would be crowded with men, all dressed in black, yes. execution black. The actual um, um, podium that had been set up for, this, yes. uh, for um, the executioner's block in black, covered in black velvet, the executioner dressed in black, and Mary herself arriving in her black robe with her flowing white veil, which signify her spirituality and her innocence. And, um, and then when she got to, on, um, to um, make ready for um, being executed, then her ladies-in-waiting then unpinned, in those days garments were held together mainly by pins, unpinned her outer garments to reveal her undergarment of a red robe, which was indeed the colour of Catholic martyrdom. It's also interesting that Anne Boleyn also wore red at her when she was beheaded, and whether Mary herself was, was making an allusion to the death of Elizabeth's mother, 
who again had been um, uh, beheaded on the say so of of men, yeah. um, and um, and uh, uh, falsely many believe in terms of the accusations that were made against her, and Mary, uh, and I like to think that Mary was making a yeah. double illusion here, both to her own Catholicism, but also to the um, the, the tragedy of it, of the death of Mary's of Elizabeth's mother. Huge amount of, of research uh, went into this book, Claire. And, and I'm wondering what you learned uh, in, in the writing of this book and the research and, and what you personally most admire about Mary. Well, I do say in the book that, that you know, that there's no doubt that Mary wasn't faultless. And that although I try to explain or understand better the choices she made both in Darnley and in her marriage to Bothwell, and the um, and the, the, the 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 emotional state and the political fragility um, she was um, experiencing when she made those decisions. Um, what I eventually came to, I, I couldn't actually have any personal empathy to me because her experience, her culture, her century was so alien yeah. to my own. Uh, and so I wasn't going to pretend that suddenly I'd found a soulmate in Mary Queen of Scots. But what I did feel was real admiration for her tenacity uh, when she was a woman who was emotionally uh, quite volatile and one would have thought that actually she would crumble in captivity, yeah. but Mary didn't crumble. She used, she found other means <coughs> as her embroidery to make sure that her story persevered. Uh, and and um, and while she did, uh, uh, she very rarely uh, got involved in the plots that were made against her. We have to imagine that English Catholics used her as their muse at that time, and they were using her as their pawn in order to garner um, European support for the Catholic cause in England. And Mary very rarely uh, got involved in those in those plots. And when she finally did succumb to the Babington plot. It was 11 days after King James had finally signed the agreement with England that he would accept English money yeah. uh, as an annual um, uh, bribe, really, yeah. um, to, uh, to be on Elizabeth's side. And in that final document, Mary wasn't mentioned. And I think that final er erasure by her, not just by Elizabeth, but by her son, yeah. finally made her think, actually, if I'm going to have anything left of a life, I'm actually going to accept being involved in this plot. And she wrote back to Babington yeah. and said yes. So I feel admiration for her. Yeah. And I feel um, a huge amount of pity for the betrayals that she yeah. had to um, uh, suffer. Uh, during her reign. Conscious of, of questions, so I think I'm probably going to open it up to the audience, mm -hmm. but whilst you're all thinking, one last question yes. from, from me, Claire, and if, if you can be brief to allow our audience in. You dedicate this book to Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, why? And what... uh, quite <laughs> simply, because she, after Mary Queen of Scots, she has been the next ruler of Scotland. Right, right. <laughs> Women, female ruler okay. of Scotland. Okay. Audience, the lady at the back. Thank you very much. Um, I came here thinking I don't need another book in Mary Queen of Scots, but um, <laughs> um, I, I wondered about, I think she was very upset when her cloth of state was taken away yes. towards the end of her years in prison. And that's maybe another symbol of how textiles were a symbol of power, even though not by her. Yes, exactly. You have to imagine in those years of imprisonment, 19 years of imprisonment in England, Mary was moved over 45 times to different premises. She had very little in, she had very little in, in, in the way of trappings of her own. 
uh, because um, the Earl of Moray, her half-brother, who was uh, um, the head of the King's party and was regent in Scotland that time, was basically selling off everything that he could out of the royal wardrobe in order to make money to fund the, um, his, his regency and, and the, the, the fight against what was called the Marian party to ensure that, that, Scotland, that Mary wasn't um, uh, set back on the Scottish throne. Uh, so there's, there's various things at the start when people are rushing around trying to uh, furnish her different apartments in different places and her various custodians uh, despair of their charge, not just of Mary, but of their kind of um, everything they had to do in order to furnish um, uh, the places where she was held. Uh, but her cloth estate, which was um, and on which was um, her mother's, it was her mother's impressa of a phoenix rising from the ashes. Um, and basically, of course, it, the phoenix again, a Catholic symbol, but also that idea of being resurrected was something that for Mary kept her spirit alive. And so it wasn't just a cloth of state, which is the cloth that hangs behind the throne, uh, that her cloth of, of state wasn't just important as a declaration of her royal um, uh, status, but also was important as a kind of um, ballast of, of spirit for Mary. And when indeed her last custodian, Paulette, um, is basically is, um, instructs it to be taken down, as she was already a dead woman, as Mary says in one of her own letters, then it was a final uh, uh, erasure of Mary as a queen. What was interesting about Mary when that happened was Mary immediately replaced it with both a set of illustrations of the final days of Christ and also with a gold crucifix. And she then claimed totally the material world of Catholicism, both in, in, in what she had around her and in how she wrote of herself. And her physician said that once that had happened, once that cloth of state had been taken down, then he had never seen her merrier than in those days. And there's a medieval idea of the Spiritu Cristo, which is this idea that actually, as a Catholic, you can then take on the sufferings of Christ as a euphoric um, uh, situation. And indeed, that it seems to be what Mary did, that once she had finally been robbed of her secular status, she then adopted a spiritual status instead as martyr. Anyone else? Thanks. I think this is utterly fascinating and I'm just interested in what you were saying earlier on about women's crafts and understanding the, the language of craft in female culture at that time. Who taught Mary and other people in the courts, in courts to sew? Because there must have been expert women crafts people who would do that. Where, do, where did they come from and do we know anything about them? We do. Um, so, so basically in the, in the court it was, it was generally male embroiderers, although in France Catherine de Medici did have a female embroiderer as part of her entourage. Um, when Mary was about uh, nine in France, then there's an entry in the French treasury accounts for, Mary, for wool for Mary to learn to make works or to make works. And work was another way that people used for the term needlework. So Mary started to embroider. Now all girls um, of, of whatever status learnt to sew. Um, em, embroidery itself was in that time just an elite women's art because it had moved out of the monasteries during the Reformation and, and came into court. It was a, a, a time of, of changing technology. So fine needles were just being uh, developed in Spain. They, they, they discovered the technology to create fine, uh, f fine needles as opposed to the hand-hammered needles that, that, that were, were, had been available before. And they were just beginning to be imported into the courts. And that allowed the sewing of much more intricate patternings, but also allowed the sewing on finer fabrics. <coughs> 
So Catherine de Medici, for instance, for all we know of her as the as the woman who, you know, indulged in black magic and was you know, the poisoner and all the things about her, every afternoon after dinner used to sit embroidering. And when she died, over a thousand pieces of what was called lacquer's work, which is kind of open network, were discovered in her inventory that she was working on. Um, so for women themselves, because the women in, in those days saw embroidery absolutely the same as writing, mm. the two things were synonymous. But with women's writing, they were aware that very little of what they wrote might be conserved. But actually, because of the value of fabric and thread, it was much more likely that when they sewed, that would be um, treasured and cherished for a much longer period because of its monetary value. Never mind, you know, that it came from somebody of significance. So elite women used it as another form of writing. Probably got time for <coughs> one more. Hi, Claire. Thanks Hi. for that, and thanks so much for the books as well. Um, I just wondered if you could um, just speculate a little bit about the importance of the maker in the right, writing of history, because you know, your description of the, of the embroidery, goodness, um, someone who wasn't as skilled as you are at making would never have been able to see or pick up the nuances and intimacies um, of, your, of, of that kind of reading. So, and, and obviously you were doing that too in your previous book. So um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about the particular nature of you as a maker and a historian? Well, my inspiration to write Threads of Life, my first book was Edmund Duval's uh, Hair with Amber Eyes. I don't know oh. how many have read that. But reading that book, it, it's a book when he, he's a ceramicist, um, but he then um, basically was left a, a set of little Japanese ivory carvings by his great uncle, and he decided to try and trace their history um, of his family, of his, of his Jewish family. Um, but he did it with the eye and the feel of a ceramicist. And I'd never read a book like that before. And that led me to think, well, I actually, as somebody who's always um, have sewn, um, then I might be able to do the same kind of idea with textiles. Uh, so I think there is a thing where by, if you, you know, even looking at a cat in Holyrood House, they were very kind and turned it over for me so I could see its underside. So then you can actually see the mending that yeah. happened over the years. You know that other hands have touched that. Very rudimentary, so probably given to some child in later centuries who was very bored on a wet Wednesday. And they said, could you just mend that bit of old embroidery we've got there by Mary Queen Scott? Um, <laughs> and uh, what I like about being a maker is, again, going back to a cat, is that I was able to perceive the fact the stitches weren't even, which might not be, you know, I say in the book, the, 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 in, in other, if I was looking at other kind of forms of craft, I wouldn't necessarily be able to have that insight, but I can have that insight with textiles because I know what it involves to actually what it feels like to, to pick up that piece of cloth and to do that, that, that sewing. Um, I think so we're hopefully all... it's something I can offer in those books. I think we're all very glad uh, that, that you did. Um, <laughs> you. I'm, I'm tempted to ask you what's next. Who else has captured your imagination? Well, actually, at the moment, it's with the publishers, I'm, 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 and it might not happen, is um, uh, because it's not about textiles. But what it is is about um, something else that I've always been fascinated by. And so it, the, my idea it might not happen, but we'll wait and see. As, as say they're making their minds up about it at the moment. Touch is, wood. Is, touch wood is a book called Wonder. And uh, what I want it to be about is basically small, surprising moments of delight that we have from a puppet play, from blowing bubbles, from uh, fire shows, from there's all sorts of little bits of entertainment yeah. and joy that have very rarely been written about. Uh. And after and during lockdown, 
I thought, I really do not want to write another tragedy. What I'd like to do is write something that actually has got a different kind of appeal. Yeah. And I've, in my past life um, as an arts administrator, I've organised puppet shows, fire shows, all sorts yeah. of things like that. I've made toy theatres. My, my, my early life started in theatre. So I've made toy theatres. I have a couple of Pollux toy theatres. And these things have always fascinated me. Mm. And so I would like to write that book. Well, everything crossed. Yes, everything Claire. crossed. So we wait and see if they... They're very dismayed that textiles don't... <laughs> they said, could you do soft toys? I said, no, no. Claire's book, uh, as well as other books, uh, are upstairs in the bookshop. Uh, but for now, can you join with me in thanking Claire Hunter? Thank you, Susan. Thank you.